Welcome to this first presentation about Formula Student Electric Vehicles, in which I'll be discussing the shutdown circuit. The presentation is intended for new teams, students and scrutineers who are familiarising themselves with the EV rules. This set of notes was taken from a lecture that I gave at the University of Liverpool in November 2019. First, a personal introduction. My name is Craig Powers. I am a control systems engineer in the power generation industry. Motorsport is just a hobby and I have my own single seat race car that I campaign in UK hill climbs and sprints. I've been volunteering at Formula Student since 2003 in many roles, including in Germany and Russia, and I've been an electric vehicle scrutineer for the past six years. This shutdown circuit schematic diagram is taken from the 2019 Formula Student rules as used in the UK and in Germany, and we will compare it with the 2020 version. There are a number of small changes to the 2020 diagram. The rules for overcurrent or short circuit protection have been strengthened and it is necessary to have protection within 100 millimetres of the low voltage source. An activation contact is also shown. This isn't a rules change as such, it's just bringing the diagram up to date. It is necessary to perform additional actions to activate the tractive system and that's what this contact refers to. I won't be talking about the extra contacts for the driverless autonomous vehicles within this presentation. The shutdown circuit is a conventional low voltage interlock or safety circuit. The two key components are an LV power source, usually a battery, and a set of heavy duty relays or contactors whose contacts isolate the accumulator from the tractive system. The heavy duty contacts are not shown in this diagram, only the coils are shown. The accumulator isolation relays, abbreviated to AIR, are heavy duty relays that have a low voltage coil and a heavy duty switching contact. They are usually called contactors. The EV rules require that both poles of the accumulator be switched by AIRs, so there must be a minimum of two of them, one for the positive and one for the negative. Providing dual switching is a mitigation against a single contactor having a stuck or welded contact. The second AIR is still available to break the tractive system HV current path. This is an example of redundancy. It is very important to be able to detect if one channel of a dual redundant system has failed. The tractive system active light must monitor the status of the AIRs to detect for a stuck or welded contact. Therefore, I suggest that you use an AIR version that has an auxiliary contact for use by the Tractive System Active Light Monitoring Circuit. The circuit diagram shows a precharge circuit in line with the AIR coils. The EV rules require that the Tractive System is precharged to charge up any inherent capacitance and avoid harmful inrush currents when the AIRs close. To do this, one AIR is closed before the other and the tractive system is charged via a pre-charge resistor that is temporarily switched into circuit. Once the tractive system is at 90% or more of the accumulator voltage, then the second AIR can be closed. The shutdown circuit is a series chain of closed volt-free contacts. All of the contacts must be closed for the accumulator isolation relays to energize. If any of the protective devices detects a fault or dangerous condition, then that contact is opened, the chain is broken, and the shutdown circuit de-energizes, thereby opening the AIRs. Although there is nothing, as far as I can see, to disallow solid state switching, care is required to avoid an output stage from feeding power into the shutdown circuit. Otherwise, it could bypass the protective functions that are upstream in the chain. So for this reason, I would recommend the use of volt-free contacts in the shutdown circuit. Normally open versus normally closed contacts. This is a regular source of confusion. The manufacturer of a relay does not know what you're going to use a relay for. 
and does not know what constitutes normal within your system. The only way that they can sensibly define the contact configuration is when the relay coil is de-energized. So normally open and normally closed typically refer to the state of the contacts when the device is de-energized as you receive it from the manufacturer. I recommend that you use the manufacturer's terminology when describing the electrical state of your shutdown circuit. You can clarify this in the descriptions within the ESF. So for example, you may say that the IMD has a normally open output contact, but that the contact is closed when healthy. That fully defines the system and will help anybody who is pre-scrutineering the document. But be careful when you are selecting components that you understand the terminology used by the manufacturer. This is an example of the table taken from an ESF and you can see that the author has avoided any doubt by specifying the manufacturer's configuration of the contacts and also the state of the contact when the system is healthy. So for example the IMD is a normally open contact but would normally be closed with the car powered and healthy. The low voltage master switch is the first item in the shutdown circuit chain. The shutdown circuit can only energize when this master switch is closed. The master switch also switches the low voltage feed to auxiliary circuits such as the ECU, cockpit indication, tractive system active light and so on. The typical master switches are the 90 degree rotary type which have a removable key. They're readily used within motorsport. You will see that the switch has heavy duty terminals designed for switching a battery supply but these are not typically used in this application. The same type of switch will be used for the tractive system master switch. And there is a requirement in the rules to provide a tag out facility or a means of locking the switch to prevent unauthorized access. And the typical way to do this is to drill a small hole through the black barrel of the switch to accept the shank of a padlock. The key is held by the electrical safety officer and only he or she can activate the car. The brake system plausibility device or BSPD is a mitigation against an inverter or motor controller which is no longer responding to the ECU or accelerator pedal. The BSPD must be standalone and non-programmable. This ensures that the design is technologically simple and can be checked during pre-scrutineering. The BSPD will trigger if it detects greater than 5 kilowatts of tractive system power and hard braking simultaneously for more than 500 milliseconds. If it detects both drive and hard braking, then it opens the shutdown circuit, thereby isolating the accumulator from the tractive system. The 5 kilowatts of power is measured at the DC feed from the accumulator. Most sensors actually measure current flow. So if this is the case on your car, then you should calculate 5 kilowatts equivalent current at the maximum tractive system voltage so that your calculations err on the conservative side. In recent years, the rules have been relaxed to allow the BSPD to auto reset after 10 seconds has elapsed. The BSPD cannot be reset by the driver. Refer to rules T11.6. The insulation monitoring device, or IMD, checks for leakage currents between the high voltage supply lines and chassis ground. If it detects a leakage current, then this suggests that the insulation of a HV cable or component is failing. In this event, the shutdown circuit will be opened, thereby isolating the accumulator from the tractive system. EV 6.1.6 .6 states that a shutdown via the IMD must be latched and not resettable by the driver. Also, the latch reset logic must be non-programmable. The IMD is required for charging, so many teams install the IMD within the accumulator housing. The successful operation of the IMD relies on the effective grounding of all conductive components which could potentially come into contact with the tractive system HV. It's vital that you pay good attention to the grounding of your car's components 
This is extensively checked at scrutineering. Think carefully about what could potentially become live, either directly or indirectly, if there is a fault. The accumulator management system, or AMS, monitors the voltages and temperatures of cells and monitors the tractive system current. If it detects that a cell or the entire accumulator is operating out of specification, then the AMS will trigger and open the shutdown circuit. Rule EV 6.1.6 .6 states that a shutdown via the AMS must be latched and not resettable by the driver. Furthermore, the latch reset logic must be non-programmable. The accumulator management system is a very complex system in its own right and is typically an integral part of the accumulator package. I recommend that you have good diagnostics and fault finding features to aid in the development and debugging of the AMS, as well as for monitoring real-time status of the accumulator. Three emergency shutdown buttons must be provided. These are normally closed shutdown buttons, typically with a mushroom head, as used as emergency stop buttons adjacent to rotating equipment. There are two buttons which are intended for the marshals to use, and they are on each side of the car. A third button is on the cockpit dashboard for use by the driver. Please pay attention to the EV rules regarding button size, button location and their labelling. When operated, the switches should latch open until manually reset. The inertia switch is designed to detect accelerations resulting from an impact. This normally closed switch will latch open and de-energise the shutdown circuit. It is quite acceptable for it to be placed in reach of the driver so that the driver can reset it if accidentally triggered. In earlier Formula Student rules, a particular manufacturer switch was specified. The rules are now more open and other manufacturer switches can be used, but the rules still point the designer to the Sensata range of devices. The switch should be rigidly attached to the chassis, but should be detachable if necessary to allow testing. We will test the switch during EV scrutineering, e.g. by removing the switch and shaking it. The breakover travel switch or BOTS is a normally closed switch which is triggered when the brake pedal over travels as a result of loss of hydraulic brake pressure. Various types of switches can be used including foot switches, toggle switches or mushroom head emergency switches. All are permissible as long as they are adequately robust. The switch must latch in the open position if operated and must not be resettable by the driver. The bots must not be fitted with an output stage. Although not an electrical matter, please ensure that loss of hydraulic pressure in one of your hydraulic circuits, front or rear, will still allow the bots to operate. Please bear in mind that the good hydraulic circuit will offer a resisting force and the brake balance bar, if you have one, will tend to pivot around the resisting hydraulic cylinder linkage. It's unlikely that you will experience a simultaneous dual circuit failure. Just one circuit will have the problem. Set up your brake pedal, balance bar and box with this in mind. The high voltage disconnect or HVD must be fitted with a low voltage pilot interlock. There is a general requirement that any tractive system HV connections should have a pilot interlock to prevent high voltage terminals being exposed when the plug and socket are apart. The LV pilot interlock is part of the shutdown circuit chain so that removal of the HVD will break the shutdown circuit as well as breaking the HV current path. The pilot interlock is just a shorting link within the removable HVD plug. The Tractive System Master Switch, or TSMS, is a second isolation switch in the chain. It's similar to the low voltage master switch, i.e. a 90 degree rotary type is usually used, as already described. The TSMS must be the last switch in the shutdown circuit chain, other than the optional interlocks precharge circuit and the activation logic.
The EV rules require that the tractive system master switch is fitted with a tag out or locking off facility. This photograph shows a typical arrangement with a hole drilled through the barrel of the switch to accept the shank of a padlock. The electrical safety officer holds the key to the padlock to prevent unauthorised excess by any other team members. Note there are very specific rules about the locations of the switch. They need to be on the right hand side of the car adjacent to the tractive system measurement points. There are also rules about the labelling and the coloured surround around the switch and the orientation of the keys when they are in the on position. The diagram shows optional interlocks. As already discussed, any tractive system HV connection which can be dismantled must have a low voltage pilot interlock, which will break the shutdown circuit chain if the tractive system plug and socket are not fully engaged. This includes the plug and socket pairs from the accumulator housing, from the charger and from the HVD. If you have outboard motors, then they must be protected by a pilot interlock running along the wishbones of the upright and motor. So that in the event of a serious impact which damages the suspension, then the high voltage is disconnected by the shutdown circuit. So we have walked through the key shutdown circuit elements. The diagram shows the minimum requirement. You are free to add extra switching contacts if you wish, but please make sure that you do not impair the overall reliability of your vehicle. Active protection circuits should be engineered so that they fail open if there is a fault or disconnection. Use high quality wiring and connections at all times. Avoid faults that can affect multiple input channels, e.g. both apps, or affect multiple protective systems, e.g. through shared power feeds. This sort of fault is called a common mode failure. In recent years, the rules have been strengthened with regard to system robustness. So please read the rules on safety critical signals. I suggest you provide good diagnostics to enable complex subsystems to be rapidly debugged if there is a fault. This will help you at the event. When engineering fail safe systems, be careful with the BSPD, IMD and AMS which are active powered protection systems. Ensure that the protection system itself fails open and any output stage or latch reset logic also fails open. I will take you through some common mistakes on the shutdown circuit. This follows on directly from the previous slide. Output stages that are not designed to be fail safe, i.e they don't fail open on power failure. And this is particularly true of the BSPD, IMD and the accumulator management system. So read the safety critical signals rules and adhere to them. Ensure that your subsystems and input circuits, output circuits, power stages and any latch and reset circuits are engineered according to the safety critical signals rules. For your convenience, I've searched through the 2020 rule set to find the systems which are classed as safety critical. Every system that is required to open the shutdown circuit must have its own non-programmable power stage to achieve this. Some items which are straightforward buttons, the shutdown buttons, the bots, the tractive system master switch, must use the Vaughan volt-free contact and they must not act through any power stage. One problem that we find is teams combining protective function outputs, e.g. by logic, into a single contact. This creates a single point of failure which reduces the overall reliability of the design. This is not, not permitted. A particular problem seems to occur with the AMS and the IMD, which are required to have a reset and latch facility. So some teams decide to merge the two. Do not do this. Another problem is the order 
of the items in the shutdown circuit chain. The Tractive System Master Switch must be the last switch before the AIRs, except for the pre-charged circuit and any hardwired interlocks. All of the shutdown circuit contacts must be on the high side connection of the AIRs and the pre-charged circuitry. Do not put any of the protective function contacts between the AIRs and the chassis ground. Two common problems are missing low voltage pilot interlock on HV connectors and HV connectors which are non-locking and can come apart due to vibration. Pay attention to this. Make sure that any HV plug and socket which can be disconnected have locking mechanisms and a pilot interlock. Occasionally, we see a team that has not mounted the inertia switch rigidly to the chassis, e.g. by the use of Velcro or some sort of foam. We understand why they do this. It's so that it's easily detachable for testing, but such mechanisms can mask the decelerations that are vital for the sensor working correctly. Every year we get several teams who have not implemented the APPS brake plausibility check as defined in EV 2.3. One of the reasons is there's no obvious placeholder in the ESF template. The wording of the APPS brake plausibility rules reads very similarly to the BSPD rules, but these functions are different. The BSPD is a mitigation against an inverter or motor controller that is not responding to the ECU torque demand. Whereas the APPS brake plausibility is a mitigation against a stuck accelerator pedal. The BSPD must be implemented as a standalone non-programmable device and it acts directly into the shutdown circuit as we've already seen. The APPS brake plausibility does not act into the shutdown circuit. It's typically implemented in software for example, in the ECU, and it sets the torque demand to zero. So in summary, we have walked through the key elements of the shutdown circuit, and we've discussed what failsafe design means in the context of a formula student car. We've discussed the conventions of normally open versus normally closed contacts as specified by manufacturers of switching devices. We've talked in overview about safety critical systems and signals, and I've taken you through some of the common mistakes that we see each year. So I'd like to thank you for listening. I would like to stress that this is my own work. It's not official or sanctioned by any of the Formula Student or SAE organisations or competitions. I've provided my email address and would welcome any feedback or discussion, but I cannot answer any specific questions about your car and its entry to a Formula Student or SAE competition. I cannot answer any eligibility questions. So I would urge you to use the formal mechanism, which in the case of the UK is the Formula Student Question Database. Thank you very much.